Welcome to Marine Science Friday. Um, make sure that you guys can hear me okay. I'm pretty sure everything's good here. Um, but welcome to the Marine Science Friday lecture series. Um, this series is designed to showcase graduate student research at Florida Atlantic University's Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. And so over the next couple of weeks, you are going to um, get to hear from some of our students, hear about their presentation, or I'm sorry, their projects, and then also ask them all of your questions. Um, so collaboration is really an important part of research in general. And so with that in mind for these presentations, we're going to have two students speak that are working on similar topics and are collaborating in their research goals. And so for today's presentation, we're going to be hearing about um, from taste buds to toxins. And it's going to be about understanding, um, sorry, feeding ecology and toxin transfer of sharks and rays in the Indian River Lagoon. And so our, we've got two presenters, like I said, Bree Cahill and Michelle Edwards. They are both students in our Marine Science and Oceanography Master's program. And they work with Dr. Matt Ajanian. I'm gonna let them fill you guys in on all of the details of their projects. We're gonna hear from Bree first and then Michelle will be presenting afterwards. If you guys have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to ask them using the Q&A button in the bottom center of your screen. So with that, we'll uh, get Bree sharing her screen and she can take things away. Awesome, thanks so much for that introduction, Madeline. Um, just wanted to make sure that y'all can see my screen. Good to go? Good. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. Uh, well, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out today. Uh, like Madeline's uh, introduced us, Michelle and I are going to be talking about from taste buds to toxins, understanding the feeding ecology and toxin transfer of sharks and rays in the Indian River Lagoon. So a little bit of background on sharks and rays. Uh, sharks and rays are both considered to be cartilaginous fishes, which means that their structure is made primarily of cartilage rather than bone, unlike other fish. And within cartilaginous fishes, there are over a thousand different species. And so these cartilaginous fishes developed back during the Devonian period in the age of fishes around 400 million years ago. Within cartilaginous fishes, we have our batoids, which are uh, rays and skates, and they're distinct from their other shark relatives by having a, a flattened appearance with gill slits on their um, underside. And so these different type, or these um, cartilaginous fishes, batoids, developed around 145 million years ago. And within batoids, there are 26 different families within four orders, and there are around 630 different species included in batoids. So a lot of diversity there. So while I could talk about all of them, I'm only going to be talking about one type of ray that's, that's found in the order myliobatiforms. So within myliobatiforms, there's the family Adobatidae, which means pelagic eagle ray. And so within pelagic eagle rays, there are only five species, um, and they have a circumtropical distribution, which means that they are found in the tropics uh, all around the world, in the Atlantic, in the Pacific, and in the Indian Ocean. This ray down here in the bottom left is our white spotted eagle ray, which is the ray that we're gonna be talking about today. But we also have the long headed eagle ray, the Naru eagle ray, the Pacific eagle ray, and the spotted eagle ray. So the white spotted eagle ray, like I said, is um, a ray common to Florida waters. They're listed as near threatened by the IUCN red list. Uh, however, they are protected here in Florida coastal waters. Uh, because of their pelagic nature, they can be highly migratory with northern extents reaching up to North Carolina and southern extents reaching down to Brazil. Um, De Groot et al. 2021 found that populations found here in the Indian River Lagoon um, tend to be fairly residential, whereas populations found over on the Gulf side of Florida uh, tend to be more migratory. And so because of their migratory nature, they can encounter fisheries in Mexico and Venezuela. So these rays are really cool because they have evolved to have this uh, jaw morphology with this plate-like dentition that allows them to effectively consume hard shell prey uh, like bivalves, marine snails, and some crustaceans like hermit crabs. And so using their pectoral fins, they're able to 
very easily stir up the sediment and then they're able to bury their head into the sediment in order to find those deeper burrowing organisms. So this is just a quick little glimpse as to what it looks like when they're feeding. I'm gonna mute that really quickly. And so what it looks like is they'll spend the entire time with their, their snout on the, on the sea floor and then they'll look. And then as soon as they encounter something that smells like it could be a prey item, they're able to uh, dig their head down and uh, try to capture that prey item. And so why are we interested in studying spotted eagle rays? Well, for starters, we don't know a huge amount about them. And we especially don't really know a whole lot about their diet in Florida waters. And so just to develop some baseline information, we wanna understand what their diet is and what their trophic ecology is in Florida coastal waters, or rather how they fit in with a food web with other, with other organisms. Their diet has been described in Mexico and Bermuda, which I'll get into, but we think that there could be some differences between those locations. Additionally, uh, shellfish enhancement or shellfish restoration, which is the process of raising shellfish for consumption for humans, or shellfish restoration, which is the process of deploying shellfish into the field in order or into the environment in order to um, improve water quality, both fall under the giant umbrella of shellfish enhancement. And this is mainly um, this is mainly due to uh, there being very small natural populations of certain shell shellfish species like hard clams. And so this is one way for us to ask the question of are they potentially interacting with these um, shellfish enhancement, whether it's for aquaculture or restoration. So we have a few main goals for this project, the first of which is to characterize prey importance to the diet of white spotted eagle rays via their stomach contents. The second of which is to assess stable isotopic tissue variation for white spotted eagle rays, which I'll go in and explain further in a few minutes. And then the final is to assess variation in stable isotope values for their prospective prey items. So like I mentioned a few minutes ago, white spotted eagle ray diet has been assessed in a few different areas within their range. Uh, in Mexico, their diet was found to be primarily, or primarily marine snails with a little bit of bivalves. And these are our snails and these are some of our bivalves. With a tiny bit of hermit crabs thrown in, in Bermuda it was almost exclusively bivalves. And then a commonly, or a closely related species, the spotted eagle ray or Aetobatus oscillatus, um, in Australia, again, found to be primarily marine snails, some bivalves, and quite a few uh, hermit crabs compared to the other locations, whereas in Taiwan, it was primarily marine snails. So we think that their diet could vary substantially based on the location, which is why we're really interested in understanding what it's like here in Florida. So there are two main methods we're going to be using in order to assess uh, their diet. The first of which is visual identification of their stomach contents. Um, but we will be using a method called DNA barcoding as a tool to supplement that visual identification. And so I'm sure as you can imagine, when you're sorting through stomach contents, you might be able to identify some things. However, there will be plenty of digested material or small bits that will be a little harder to understand or harder to identify. So our plan is to use a method called DNA barcoding which is a way of taking that unidentified tissue and being able to sequence a small portion of its genome. Think of it like when you're going to a grocery store, every product has a specific barcode. And what it's able to do is when you're able to scan that barcode, it can look through an entire database and match uh, that barcode to a specific item. Well, this is exactly what we're doing with these stomach contents. So that barcode piece that we're looking for is a gene called the cytochrome C oxidase subunit one gene. And that's chosen because it's known to be a well-known identifier for animals. And so we take that tissue and we extract the DNA and try to sequence it to match a specific CO1 barcode in a, a barcode database like GenBank and Barcode of Life and hope that we can get a match. That way we can properly identify that tissue. Another method that we're gonna be using for this is a method called stable isotope analysis, which is a chemical and ecological approach for us to understand the assimilated diet. So how over time dietary patterns are incorporated into your tissues. And so we do that using nitrogen and carbon. Um, nitrogen tells us the trophic level or what level within a food web they're feeding at. So as you can see here, there's a snook at the top of the food web because it's the top predator being considered. 
And then we talk about uh, carbon as it refers to the environment that that animal was foraging within. And so this is very beneficial because it gives us insight to their diet, especially when we don't have access to their stomach contents. So for this project, we've been going around and trying to catch white spotted eagle rays over in the Indian River Lagoon and over in Sarasota, Florida. And so we do that by visually spotting a ray from the boat. And then once we do spot one, we try to quickly uh, set a net around it and try to capture the ray within that net. And then from there, we're able to move the ray into the live well on our boat. Once the ray is in the live well, we are able to collect measurements, do tags, or um, place tags, but we're also able to collect blood and muscle biopsies for that stable isotope analysis. In addition to the stable isotope analysis, we're also using a method called pulse gastric lavage, which is a non-lethal way of collecting stomach contents. And so we do that by having a bilge pump that runs water through this tube and it goes down the throat and into the stomach of the ray. And this gently flushes their digestive tract that we were able to collect the contents in a mesh bag and observe those contents at a later date. So this is just a, a close up of what some of those samples look like. So over here, we have our muscle biopsy that's about eight millimeters in diameter. So it's a very small little plug, but it tells us a lot about what they're doing as far as their diet goes. And then we also have our blood that's after it's been spun down. So we have our plasma up top and we have our red blood cells on the bottom of which are two different tissues that we like to look at. And then here's another close up of the stomach contents. So as you can see, there are some pieces that are very distinct that we should be able to identify, but then there's also a lot of material that just is very hard to determine. So it provides um, that DNA barcoding will provide some valuable assistance when it comes to properly identifying the stomach contents. Another component that is very critical to this project is prey collection. And so we go out into the field and try to collect as many different prey items, whether they're bivalves, marine snails, or hermit crabs, or any kind of invertebrate we can really find. And we're targeting these accessible sandbars and shallow benthic habitat um, for a few different reasons. The first of which is we wanna develop a visual guide, as you can see here, of what their internal tissue looks like without the shell. One thing about eagle rays is that they're very, very efficient at getting the meat off of the shell. And when we're sorting through the stomach contents, there's almost zero shell. So it can make it very challenging to really identify what the prey items are. And so this visual guide will hopefully help us. That way when we're processing the stomach contents, the tissue will look familiar enough that we'll be able to just visually identify it. Another component of this prey collection process is that we wanna build that DNA library. So the CL1 region is very um, productive at identifying different animal species. However, not all animals have had their CL1 region sequenced just yet. And so by having hands on these animals, if there's any that we've identified from their shell, um, if there's any that we've been able to identify that don't have their CL1 region sequenced, we're able to take tissue samples, sequence that CL1 region, and then contribute it back to those databases I was telling you about. And then the final reason for this prey collection is for stable isotope analysis. And so we're able to take all of this tissue, dry and grind it, and then send it off to get those stable isotope values. And this will help us um, kind of retroactively calculate what those rays could potentially have been foraging on. So for stomach contents, back in 2020, we were able to collect uh, 26 different gastric lavage samples um, from 32 different eagle rays. And so far in 2021, we've collected four stomach contents from five rays, uh, which is great. And we'll be able to continue assessing those stomach contents. However, we have not been able to um, finish all of that to be able to incorporate it into this presentation. So what we're gonna be talking about today are 15 different samples that we have collected from uh, over in Sarasota between 2015 to 2018. Just to orient you to this plot, we have our 15 different eagle rays here at the bottom. And then we have our proportion of positive identifications of those stomach contents. So not necessarily uh, proportion of diet, but that proportion of identification. And something to note is that no two stomachs are alike. 
These rays are eating a variety of different prey items and they might not be as selective as uh, we think they could be. However, there are three species that are found in at least a third of the stomach contents, of which include the sunray venus clam, the banded tulip, and the Florida fighting conch. So these three prey items could make up a bulk of their diet, but we don't know based off of these 15 rays. Um, as we continue to incorporate more stomachs, we'll be able to really solidify that. Additionally, we wanted to look at these positive identifications uh, in reference to eagle ray disc width size or from wingtip to wingtip. And so again, it looks like there isn't much of a pattern here, but I'll be sure to point it out. So here, there are three different species that we're observing across the size range uh, considered here, of which include the sunray venus clam, the banded tulip, and the lettered olive. And that could be a result of the sunray venus clam having a slightly thinner shell, so it might be an easier clam for these rays to consume regardless of size. And then for the two uh, marine snails that are considered, they're typically fairly small, usually under two inches in shell length. Um, so it could just be something that's easier to fit in their mouth, regardless of ray size and mouth dimensions. Conversely, when we're considering some of the thicker shelled bivalves, we're only seeing them for some of the larger rays, which could have to do with those mouth dimensions like I was mentioning. So we have the Atlantic surf clam. We have the Mercenaria hard clam, shown here in dark blue, which is that clam I was telling you about for shellfish enhancement. We have our lightning whelk in yellow, which tends to get very large in shell length. And then we have our Florida fighting conch here in purple, of which is um, we're likely only seeing in these larger rays because as these uh, Florida fighting conch get older, they tend to get develop a thicker shell. And so it can make it a little bit more challenging for the rays to eat. Regarding stable isotopes, uh, we have collected stable isotope samples from 43 different individuals. Uh, between the Atlantic coast and the Gulf Coast. The Atlantic coast uh, consists of a few different years as we were able to take advantage of some of those archive samples. Um, and they consist of a few different tissue types, including muscle, plasma, and red blood cells. As we uh, continue on in this progress or project, we, were, we will be able to um, contribute a few additional samples from both the Atlantic coast and the Gulf Coast from both 2020 and moving forward in 2021. So when we're looking at these stable isotope plots, again, I wanna refresh your memory that nitrogen deals with the trophic level of that animal. So um, looking at the food web, who is the top predator, who is a primary producer, who is a primary consumer eating uh, some of that vegetation. But here we're looking at those eagle ray tissue types. And so over here is our eagle ray muscle of which tends to have a longer isotopic turnover period, which means that it takes longer for the body to work its way through those cells. Whereas for blood samples, um, the body processes that very fast. And so that could potentially be a reason why we're seeing higher nitrogen and higher carbon in these muscle samples because it those cells stay in the body for a lot longer duration than it does for the tissues uh, in, involved in blood. Additionally, when we're looking at the difference in between the Atlantic and the Gulf Coast, um, it does look fairly similar in between the three tissue types. Well, between the two tissue types, uh, there are no red blood cells for the Gulf Coast. It looks as though the Gulf Coast does have a slightly lower nitrogen value, which could mean that the rays caught over on the Gulf Coast are eating um, prey items that are found lower on the food web. Like instead of eating marine snails, they might be eating more of the bivalves. But additionally, we're seeing that they have a higher carbon value, which could mean that they're feeding in different uh, ecosystems, whether they're feeding like animals caught in the Atlantic could be feeding mainly in areas that are predominantly macroalgae, whereas in the Gulf, they could potentially be eating foraging in areas that are primarily seagrass beds. And then finally, we wanted to look at uh, some stable isotope values for those prey items. And what we have here are 14 different species that were uh, collected. And if and I definitely don't have a suitable enough sample size in order to run statistics, but we are starting to see some general patterns and that all of the bivalves tend to have a lower nitrogen value and a lower carbon value. 
Um, and that's likely because they are primary consumers feeding on phytoplankton or other material that's suspended in the, in the water. And then additionally, we're seeing some of our uh, crustaceans like hermit crabs have a middle range nitrogen value because they're feeding on honestly whatever they can come across while they're on the sediment. And then finally, we're seeing some of our carnivorous uh, marine snails or our marine snails that are foraging on animals like bivalves. And then we have our one lonely herbivorous marine snail with the highest carbon value and a, uh, a fairly middle range nitrogen value of which could be because it's foraging on similar material as that of some of the bivalves or some of the um, crustaceans. So some preliminary conclusions we have are that some species are observed across all size ranges for these eagle rays, of which include the sunray venus, the banded tulip, and the lettered olive snails. Whereas some of those thicker shelled bivalves and thicker shelled gastropods are only observed in some of the larger eagle rays, of which could deal with that jaw morphology we were talking about. Um, additionally, in the stomach contents, there was a limited consumption of those crustaceans or hermit crabs, of which could potentially be a result of um, maybe mistaken identity, but I can tell you that for these 2020 samples that we've collected so far, we're definitely seeing crustaceans in the diet. So that could be something that changes between the years. And then finally, we are seeing tissue variation in stable isotope analysis, um, which could deal with some of that isotopic turnover rate that I was telling you about, um, but it could also change as we're continuing to incorporate more samples. And finally, I just wanted to hit on the significance of why we're really wanting to understand these things. Um, like we saw in the stomach contents, some of those stomach contents do include mercenaria hard clams, which as I mentioned earlier, are primarily used for that shellfish enhancement. So up in this top image is a picture of a clam lease, which is one of those areas where all the clams are deployed into the field or into the, the natural environment. That way they can continue to grow over time. But because they're deployed in these bags by millions within the area, it can definitely attract predators like these rays. And so additionally, because the natural populations of these hard clams are so low, it's possible that these rays are interacting with the shellfish enhancement and consuming the clams that are in these areas. And so if that's the case, um, we need to develop some strategies in order to prevent predation. Additionally, Again, it's important for us to just understand how reliant these rays are on benthic communities and how the energy flows within those ecosystems. That way we can really start to piece together that food web of what these rays are relying on as it's increasingly important for us to understand how the rays could be affected by coastal development or harmful algal blooms and subsequently how those um, bivalves and marine snails and crustaceans can be affected by such as well. And then finally, it's important for us to understand these trophic systems. That way we can understand just how their diet could be a source for toxins for the rays and how these toxins can continue up from the base to the food web at um, some of our bivalves, continue up to rays, and then continue up to some of these top predators. And so with that, I would like to pass it over to Michelle, but give a huge thank you to everyone in my lab or everyone in our lab, the external support that this project has received, and then all of our funding sources as well. And so with that, I will pass it over to Michelle. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to jump right into talking about um, bull sharks. So bull sharks are a large bodied carcharinid shark species. Um, and they are, they're found in coastal areas worldwide. In the Western North Atlantic, where we are, um, they're distributed between Massachusetts and Brazil. Bull sharks are urihaline, meaning they can tolerate a range of salinities. And because of that, they commonly occur in subtropical estuaries and lagoons, like our own Indian River Lagoon. Bull sharks are born at 56 to 81 centimeters total length, and that measurement is from the tip of the shark's snout to the tip of its tail, and they mature around 200 centimeters total length, which is just over six feet. Bull sharks are the most common shark species found in the IRL. 
And the population here includes juvenile sharks up to nine years of age. Um, no adult male bull sharks have ever been encountered in the IRL and few adult females have been seen, um, but females are usually seen in the early spring and we think they're coming into pup because part of the lagoon is recognized as bull shark nursery habitat. However, long-term data on space use of the IRL by juvenile bull sharks is limited. In addition, diet information on bull sharks in the IRL is limited to two studies done in the 1980s, but bull sharks in the system are thought to be apex, apex piscivores that mainly consume mullet, marine catfishes, and Atlantic stingray. So today I wanna to show you how we can use information on bull shark diet and use of the IRL to better understand something else. Harmful algal blooms. Harmful algal blooms are an overgrowth of algae that negatively affect the environment in some way. And this may be in the way of wildlife mortalities, degradation of habitats like coral reefs or seagrass beds, um, or economic costs, um, particularly to fisheries resources and tourism. And there has been a an apparent increase in the frequency, duration, and range of HAB events worldwide over the past several decades. And this is expected to continue to worsen under continued population growth, human development, and environmental conditions associated with climate change. And as such, HABs are a pressing issue in coastal areas worldwide. In the Indian River Lagoon, um, HABs have increased in recent years. In fact, we've seen almost yearly HAB events since the early 2000s. And this is an issue for the reasons that I mentioned, but also because many HAB species are capable of producing toxins. Um, and there are, and a variety of different toxins exist um, and a variety of different HAB species produce those toxins. But many of them, um, many of the toxins can be harmful to human and animal health. And the presence of toxins in an ecosystem is kind of difficult to assess for a few reasons. First, the presence of um, toxic HAB species does not necessarily indicate the presence of toxins. Second, um, larger blooms do not necessarily produce more toxins. And last, many HAB toxins are known to persist in the environment. So toxins may be present um, long after a bloom dissipates. One way to estimate toxin exposure in an ecosystem that mitigates these problems is the use of a sentinel or indicator species that can act as a canary in the coal mine, alerting us to hazardous conditions in the environment. And sharks and rays are known to be useful indicator species um, because they're long lived and slow growing. They share food and water resources with humans. And the high trophic position of many sharks um, provides kind of an integrative picture of the food web um, and could potentially alert us to toxins in lower trophic species. Oh, sorry. Sorry, so by understanding the toxins present um, in bull shark tissues, we might be able to understand which HAB toxins are present in the lagoon. And so to do this, um, we collected samples over three sampling regions in the IRL. Um, on the map here, you see the Northern region in yellow, the Central region in blue, and the Southern region in green. We sampled these regions um, twice a year in the fall and spring, um, between 2018 and 2020 using bottom long lines and gill nets. We collected samples from 50 um, juvenile bull sharks for a total of 123 samples. And these came from 32 female sharks and 18 males between the sizes of 76 centimeters and 148 centimeters total length. Um, and we've conducted toxin analysis on all but 11 of these samples so far. So today I'll be telling you about 40, 45 liver samples, 43 plasma samples, and 24 stomach content samples that we screened for 14 toxins using UP, LC, MS, MS. 
Again, we also want to understand bull shark ecology in the lagoon because it will help us make inferences about what these toxin concentrations mean. So we want to look at um, both uh, trophic and movement ecology of bull sharks in the system. And so to look at diets, um, this is similar to what Bree talked to you about. So we will um, we look at stomach contents and we sort and identify those visually um, to the lowest taxonomic class possible. So to species if we can. And we also do stable isotope analysis, but I won't be talking about that bit today. And then um, to understand how bull sharks are using um, the Indian River Lagoon spatially, um, we uh, tagged 29 juvenile bull sharks between 2016 and 2020 and tracked their, tracked their movements. Um, and to do that, we use something called acoustic telemetry. Um, and that involves um, surgically implanting a small tag into the shark's abdominal cavity with a minor surgery um, and then uh, assessing the shark's distribution patterns. And so acoustic telemetry has two parts, the tag and the receiver. So the tags are on the left and that's what's attached to the shark and the receiver is basically an underwater listening station. And so these tags make noise, um, which we call pings. And so as the shark swims around, the tag emits this sound, um, this ping. And as the shark swims within range of a receiver denoted by this red circle, the receiver picks up that sound from the tag, decodes it and stores it for us to download later. And what this information tells us is that the shark was within range or nearby to a receiver. And we have a number of these receivers in the IRL. Um, some of them belong to our lab. Um, and then some of them uh, are from cooperative networks of collaborating scientists, such as the FACT and ACT networks. And these are groups of scientists that have agreed to share their data with each other. Um, so they let us know when they pick up um, animals that we've tagged. And in this way, we can understand how bull sharks are using the IRL. So what have we found so far? So um, toxin analysis so far shows the presence of multiple toxins in the tissues of bull sharks sampled across the lagoon, including um, microcystins um, and nodularin, which are um, liver toxins, lingbia toxin, which is a skin irritant, irritant in, in humans, um, domoic acid, which is known as a mesic shellfish poisoning toxin, okadaic acid, which is known as diuretic shellfish poisoning toxin, and brevitoxin, which is known as neurotoxic shellfish poisoning, and you may have heard of from um, the Gulf where it's a lot more prevalent than here. Um, and so each circle on these maps represent individual animals and the, color denote, the colors denote the type of toxin found in each tissue type. Each map represents a tissue type. So you have liver on the left, plasma results in the middle and stomach contents results on the right side. What we can see by the color, the circles having multiple colors is that animals that tested positive for one HAB toxin often tested positive for multiple toxins. We can also see that all of the detected toxins um, were detected across the lagoon with the exception of nodularin shown in light blue and brevitoxin in red, which were only detected in a few samples and were more spatially limited because of that. All of the detected toxins um, were also present in samples from both fall and spring sampling seasons, again, except brevitoxin, which was only detected in a few samples. To put this information into perspective, we are seeing um, toxins across the lagoon, but in, relatively, but in a relatively low percentage of samples. The toxins that we're seeing the most of are domoic acid, and microcystins, and domoic acid was found in 36% of liver samples, and microcystins were found in 42% of stomach content samples. But each of these toxins were found in lower concentrations in each of the other tissue types that we tested, and all of the other toxins 
were found in less than a quarter of all samples tested. Um, so these are box plots here. Um, and I think the only thing you really need to look at is the X, which is the mean um, concentration. And the axes um, are toxin concentrations in nanogram per gram. And on the left, we have demog acid. And on the right, we have microcystins. And I kind of want to just put what we're finding into context for you. So the highest concentrations that we're seeing of demog acid are less than 250 nanograms per gram. The FDA considers 20,000 nanograms per gram of seafood flesh unsafe. So even though um, this demog acid may be in high prevalence in our samples, um, the concentrations that we are seeing are much lower than, um, than the safety regulations. Um, uh, and then um, the FDA has not established safe consumption limits for microcystins, um, but some states have and that is 1,000 nanograms per gram. And the highest concentrations that we are seeing of microcystins, again on the right, are under 100 nanograms per gram, which is less than 10% of that limit. So although we are seeing higher prevalence of these toxins, they are in relatively low concentrations. The highest concentrations of both microcystins and demoic acid, and in fact, almost every other toxin we detected were highest in the stomach content samples. And that suggests that sharks are ingesting these toxins from their prey items, which also suggests that some bony fish in the IRL contain have toxins. And so that transitions us into looking at the bull shark's diet. So um, again, we assessed um, stomach contents um, from 50 sharks, 28 of those stomachs contained prey <clears throat> and Sorry, there were 33 total prey items. Three stomachs contained more than one item and one stomach contained four items. Um, and the graph here um, on the left, you have number of, um, number of prey items that were found in the stomach. And then on the X axis, you have each individual shark and the colors denote the type of prey found um, in that shark's stomach. And visual identification of these items supports past studies in that the um, fish that uh, bull sharks are consuming the most of are um, mullet, marine catfishes, and Atlantic stingray. We did see um, just one of some other interesting fishes, including spot, sheep's head, and the common snook. Um, there were also 13 items that were only identifiable to bony fishes, um, but we hope to do some DNA barcoding with that later to find out what species uh, those fish were. Um, so looking at uh, the bull shark movement data, so I wanna orient you a little bit. So on the right-hand side, we have a map again of all the receivers that we have in the IRL and just outside of the IRL and they are color-coded north in blue, um, central in yellow, south in gray, and then the red triangles are offshore receivers. And um, then the graph here shows detections of sharks. So on the y-axis, those numbers indicate individual animals. Um, and on the x-axis, um, time since they were tagged, so 2016 to 2020, and each of the dots is um, an average daily detection. And so what we can see um, is that bull sharks were detected in the IRL year round, um, but they do appear to make short forays outside of the lagoon between October and March each year, um, shown by uh, all these pings on um, offshore receivers. And this tendency to leave the lagoon during the winter months could affect toxin exposure, which we might see in toxin concentration comparisons between sampling season. Um, so that's something we definitely have to keep an eye on. Um, this next graph 
is the percentage of days detected in each area. And the, again, the colors um, uh, match up with the different receiver regions. Um, and the tagged sharks are also color coded for the location they were tagged. So again, if, if the um, color code there is gray, they were tagged in the South Lagoon. And then these bars being gray means that 100% of the sharks detect days detected were also in the Southern Lagoon. So what we're seeing is that sharks appear to display site fidelity to specific regions because um, greater than 60% of the days detected um, were in one region for many sharks. And what we can also see by the matching colors, um, the shark is gray and most of its time was also gray, is that um, sharks we tagged in one area seem to spend their time in that area. And this is important because if bull sharks from the IRL spend a greater amount of time in specific regions where blooms of different HAB species are more or less frequent, we could um, use this information to make inferences about spatial differences in toxin loads. And so in conclusion, multiple harmful algal bloom toxins um, were present in samples collected across the Indian River Lagoon. But as a reminder, these were in low prevalence and in relatively low concentrations. Tumoc acid and microcystins were the most prevalent have tox toxins detected. Toxin concentrations of these um, different toxin types varied by tissue type with the highest concentrations in the stomach contents suggesting that bull sharks are ingesting these toxins. Stomach content data supports past literature in that bull sharks are apex predators in the system. And bull sharks spend most of their time in the IRL um, and in certain areas. Um, more work is still needed. This is an ongoing study, but we expect it will provide important information on background toxin presence in the IRL and in an important apex predator in the system. And with that, I'd like to thank um, my lab and everyone and my committee and everyone else who's helped with this project and all of my funding sources. Uh, here are my references and Bree and I can take any questions you have. Well, you guys did a fantastic job. So applause to you both. Thank you so much. Um, and yes, like, like Michelle said, we are ready to take questions. So if anybody has questions for either of them or even questions for both of them, use that Q&A button bottom center of the screen and we can uh, start to get to those. Um, but actually the first question that I wanna ask you guys uh, before we get to those public questions is, do you know what's next after grad school or do you have ideas of what you wanna do next? <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, not quite, not quite. It's looking like hopefully graduating in December, um, but just currently taking it one step at a time. This project got postponed a little bit due to COVID. And so want to make sure we have our ducks in a row for publishing all of this research, but I'd like to stay working with Rays. I really like working with them, but we'll see. Who knows? <laughs> um. I, I, I'll be graduating this summer. Um, I am obsessed with sharks for anyone who knows me and I'm really interested in conservation. 